Hi, and welcome to the Keys to Therapy. In today's episode, we're going to be discussing safety concerns for therapists. So a lot of times when you come into this field, everyone is talking to you more about what to do as far as theories go, as far as connecting with clients, paperwork, uh, stuff along those lines. But one thing that I feel like most likely isn't discussed enough, especially depending on where you work or what your what classes you're in or what you're learning, is safety concerns. I think there's this uh, maybe sometimes like idealistic fantasy of therapy where it's like, and we all done that. I know I've done it too. Where you're like, I'm going to go into this field and I'm going to help people and everyone's going to just be so grateful that, you know, they have a place to talk and I'm going to be the person that they get to talk to and to help them work through some of the horrible things that they've been through and really just come together and help them live a better life. And that does happen sometimes. It happens pretty often, actually. But something that I think people don't really want to discuss, maybe they're thinking they're like, not they're not trying to scare us or like, I don't know, make us worry too much. But it's the safety concerns. I think the reality of this field is that some of the people that we as therapists interact with are not there because they want to be there. They're there because they were forced to be there. So maybe they had a psychotic break and the police brought them in. Maybe there was a domestic violence issue and it's court-ordered therapy. Maybe they were caught doing some kind of crime that required them to have some sort of counseling before they could go back to their job or as part of their sentence. Like there's a lot of different people you'll encounter who are not going to be super excited to be in your presence as a therapist. So it's definitely something that you have to take into consideration when you're going to be working in certain places. So I know that the first place that I worked, I took a year off between my bachelor's and master's program because I had no idea which master's program to go to, to be a therapist. So in that year, I worked at a facility where it was residential and kind of outpatient, but pretty much everybody there had committed a crime and were found not guilty by reason of insanity or incompetent to proceed. So I was working with people, the majority of them were diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and everyone was medicated, but medication's not always consistent. Everybody had a violent history. Um, So it was kind of a lot. (laughs) And so I think because that was my first entry into the mental health field, I'm more cautious and like to talk more about safety concerns than maybe most people do. Um, I did not get enough of a brief on that topic when I started and I definitely saw a lot of things there and in in other places that I've worked as well that made me more cautious and so I want to share some of those things with you guys so maybe you can be able to take some precautions and make yourself feel safer and prepared for negative situations that might come up. So like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the clients that come in, they want to be there. They're excited. They're happy. They're ready to work. But some other ones aren't so much. And those are things that we need to be aware of as a therapist if we're going to be working with a client like that. So in hospital settings, you're going to come across a lot of people who are detoxing, who are very angry, who, like I mentioned earlier, maybe the cops brought in. Uh, Maybe they are there for homicidal ideation. Maybe they didn't have homicidal ideation until they got in the presence of doctors and now suddenly they want to kill everybody. So there's a lot of unstable personalities and moods and behaviors that you encounter in certain places. I know when I worked in community mental health, there was, I mean, half of the building was for people who were doing uh, substance abuse treatment and the majority of them, it was court ordered that they be there. So you're going to find different levels of engagement, but you're also going to find people who, because they're either not in the healthiest state of mind at that point, or they're really resentful that they have to be there and that resentment's coming down on you, or they have a a violent or traumatic history, you are going to see a, a wide range of things, especially in the beginning of your career, which I find that to be really ironic that sometimes the earlier therapist years as you're like in school or fresh out of school is when you get the toughest cases and you tend to work in some of the toughest places when you're a baby therapist so 
super twisted way of dealing with stuff in this field, in my opinion. And that is why sometimes there's higher burnout. So if you can at least get some of the safety stuff down, maybe you will feel better in some of these situations you may be placed in as a new therapist. So as far as the first step to take when it comes to safety concerns is you have to safety plan for yourself. Most of the time in your initial assessment, you will put together some sort of safety plan for your client, especially if they're coming in and they've had some sort of suicidal or homicidal ideation. You are going to have to do a safety plan. That's just good practice. And so part of that safety plan that you would do with clients would be, you know, who would you call in the case of an emergency? You know, what preventative steps can you take to acting on some of these thoughts or feelings? And you have to take some of the same steps for yourself. So what I would suggest is anytime you're in a new space, whether it's your first day at a new job or a new internship, or it is your first uh, time meeting a client, anything that's a first, you have to plan for your own safety. So definitely the second you start a new job or a new internship, have the safety plan for yourself the first day. So some of the things to take into consideration with that is number one, be mindful of where your chair is placed in the room. Now this may sound paranoid. A lot of the things I'm about to say may sound paranoid, but it's kind of like that old saying of wouldn't you rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it? It's kind of like that. Plan for all the safety things. And if you wasted some extra time putting these things in place, okay. But if it's gonna give you a sense of security or you're more prepared if something goes down, it's gonna benefit you. So have your chair closest to the door if possible. I know not every office space allows for that to happen, you know, depending on the setting, where the windows are, how big furniture is, stuff like that. But if you can, place your chair near the door. Part of that is so if there is some sort of emergency, not necessarily a safety one, but even a medical emergency with a client, you have the quickest route out to go get help if you need to. Um, another reason is I think it helps you maybe just feel a little bit more safe, which will, if you're more safe, you're gonna feel more present in the session as well. So if possible, keep your chair closest to the door and then the clients on the other side of the room. Now you may find if you're working with a client who has PTSD, like I know when I worked with the military, a lot of them would like to sit, if not near the door, with their eyes on the door so they could know what was going on and be prepared. They're just hyper vigilant then you know you can talk about that with a client if they have an issue with the placement and that's something you can definitely discuss in sessions but one of the very first things is make sure your chair is closest to the door so you do not get trapped in that space you can try to prevent that number two make sure all sharp objects are put away in your office so if you have scissors if you have uh I don't know, a paper cutter, like anything like that, even like hole punchers or bigger or heavier metal things, keep those hidden somewhere. Maybe those are in a desk drawer. Maybe those are in a box on a shelf somewhere in the room where it's not super visible to most people. You know, make sure that there's not, as you're eyeing your space, if it's a space that clients come into, make sure that it is not something where a lot of potential weapons are present. So uh, if I were seeing a client in this space, I'm virtual telehealth, so nobody's gonna be in this room in my house, but I would not have all these glass things. Um, I would not have just all of the stuff that's, that's currently in here. I would keep it more to a minimum, like plastic stuff or things that are just easier to handle. Um, I know at one point, and this is part of why I say this, is I had a really pretty like small glass lamp that was like frosted glass and flowers and stuff that I got at Ikea and it was in my house. And so when I started the military base, I was like, oh, this would be really pretty. Like, let me bring this to the office to help with the lighting. Well, one of my clients brought their kid to a session and the kid just yanked the cord and the glass, the little lamp fell and glass shattered everywhere. And in that moment, I thought, one, like, let's get the kid out of the way and, like, you guys clear the room so we can clean up the glass. But two, I thought, gosh, that would be really easy if somebody wanted to hurt me right now, that they could have just had this weapon right here. They could have just broke this and cut me or something. And again, I know this sounds paranoid, but there's been too many situations 
where therapists have been hurt, kidnapped, I mean, stalked, all kinds of stuff can happen to therapists. And I really just don't think it's talked about enough. Every once in a while, you'll see a story on the news or in a uh, they, therapist Facebook group or something like that, where it'll say like, you know, this therapist was trapped in their office for 10 hours with their client and they had no way of getting out or alerting anybody what was going on. Or the therapist was stalked or, um, I mean, there's just so many different things that can happen. And I know that this can happen in most professions, but I think because we are dealing with people who, like I said, some of the time they have homicidal thoughts or they have a history of violence or they're forced to be in treatment or they are taking out some of their resentments on us or playing out some unhealthy dynamics they've had in, in past relationships with us because we're the person that gets transferred to, then you know we are at more risk than a lot of professions you know i don't hear a lot of stories of people stalking their dentists probably happens but because of the personal nature of the things we talk about with clients and how much time we spend with them i think therapists in general tend to be at more risk than maybe other medical providers so yeah be cautious it's not gonna hurt uh another thing would be to try to have some sort of panic button if possible, some sort of alarm, something that you can trigger if there's an issue. I have advocated for this in every office space I have ever been in, and I've never gotten it. I've worked, the last place I worked, I worked till 7.30 at night. And um, definitely in the winter, it is pitch black at like 5.45, 6 p.m. So I'd be leaving at night, sometimes the only one in the building having to lock it up and i really wanted some sort of panic button like same thing when i worked with the military i was typically alone in an office with somebody that was much bigger much more trained athletic and it was like little me with my ponytail swinging like hey what's going on today you know and there was definitely a few situations that i was like okay this person is really triggered and highly agitated and i know that they're not mad at me but all their anger is coming at me and it'd be really nice if something happened to have a way to tell somebody because it's really quiet in this hallway today and no one else is here or the secretary's three doors down and you know you want you don't want to need those things in those situations and realize it when it's too late so if you can you know now there's so many more resources than some of the things in the places i've worked at where you just buy it yourself even if all it is is like an alarm or a lot of people have like Apple watches and things like that where you can just like tap it a few times and it'll call the police for you or send a signal to whoever your emergency contacts are. So if you are if you know you're going to work at a place where there's going to be maybe a higher risk of some sort of safety issue, like said, maybe you're working in substance abuse or with um, domestic violence or sexual offenders or something where there just is inherently typically more of a risk, uh, like I said, hospital there you're going to have a lot more staff who will be present and hear stuff but just in case any space that you know that you are going to be at higher risk have some sort of like panic button siren something that will alert people and have it somewhere handy to you that you're not going to hit all the time <laughs> so like under a chair arm you know like in a drawer on your desk like something because it's going to be really helpful and make you feel safer um, another thing is if you know you have a client coming in that can be really difficult or a client that makes you feel unsafe in some way, talk to some of your coworkers if you're in a position to be around other people and you trust them enough. You know, talk to them and just be like, hey, I have a client who's coming in next that I'm a little concerned about or I don't feel 100% safe with or I'm a little worried about the news I'm going to give them today or... Um, they sounded really agitated in the email before the session and I just kind of want everybody else to be on alert. So if you don't mind, just keep like an extra ear out today um, for whatever you hear coming through my office. Sometimes you need other people to look out for you. And if you're in a place where you have those coworkers, use them and you can do that for them as well if needed. I know that um, I can think of a family session in particular at a job I had years ago that it did not go well and there was so much screaming and it was two males and there was like yelling and big booming voices and my supervisor was in the office next to me and she knocked on the door to make sure I was okay 
So super, super appreciated that because I was like, okay, I, I have a handle on this. I would ask for help, I think, if I needed it because I was a baby therapist then. And I was just like, but it is so comforting to know that somebody else was looking out for me. And I think that will be comforting to you as well. So if you have the support, you have some people around you, ask for that, you know, even if you're like, oh, it went fine. Like, I'm so sorry I bothered you, but you know, it, it went okay. Cool. So you had somebody else looking out for you for a little bit, for the whole hour. Like, that's okay. Good. I get that support. And another thing would be if there's certain clients you're unsure of for whatever reason, like I said, maybe there's a history of violence. Maybe it's a brand new client and it's, you know, from their paperwork, their court ordered to be there, or there's, you know, something that's just feeling off to you. Um, try not to schedule them at night. So how I mentioned I was working till 7.30 at night, uh, you probably don't want to have an intake with a brand new client that late and you want to get a feel for them first and know a little, a little bit more about their history and stuff like that before maybe you agree to see them when you're alone in the building at night. Maybe that's something that you don't feel comfortable doing and you voice that to a supervisor or to the owner of the place you're at or whatever else but just try to have that be a policy for yourself that if there's something that feels a little bit off then trust that and i'll get into that more in a second but just try not to schedule them late at night you know i if you are concerned in any way about that like i said seek supervision talk to somebody about that talk to the owner or find the best way to to address that issue with them and try to like advocate for yourself with that because you don't want to go into the first session feeling uncomfortable and we're human we all have our own biases we all have our own fears and histories and traumas and concerns so if something's feeling off like i want you to be able to be like mm, let me not see this person this late at night and you know offer them a couple more times in the afternoon this week or next week and just try to limit your exposure or your potential exposure to something bad happening. Uh, the last part I would include in like a safety plan for yourself would be to just be mindful of what you're wearing. Not so much the clothes, but jewelry. So especially if you're in like a hospital setting or somewhere where you know there's going to be people who are just coming in a lot more raw, you know, very unstable or detoxing or, you know, psychotic breaks, something along those lines, like take precautions. So... Don't wear like, you know, dangly or like hoop earrings. That could be yanked down if there's a situation. Same with like necklaces, um, chains. Be careful about what you're wearing because that's something else that could be snatched or twisted. Um, even some jobs will require you to have a badge. So just be mindful of, you know, like I know one place I worked, we had like lanyards with our badge because I would work in like the... Uh, like inpatient side so I wouldn't wear it all day because I was constantly in and out of there the inpatient outpatient so I got a clip that I could put on like a belt loop and that's what I used it had like a string to go ahead and you know push my badge to the key fob thing and let me in instead of wearing it around my neck so find those little like hacks and things that will just again reduce your exposure to potential bad things happening um you don't always you can always predict what's going to happen and even sometimes in the population you may be working with children and be like oh well i'm working with kids it's fine but certain kids have outbursts or they have really bad days or very young kids sometimes don't even realize what they're doing and they're just reaching out so just try to be mindful of any of those potential risks to yourself now when you're in session with a client you want to assess for their, you know, suicidal ideation and homicidal ideation. That's good practice. That's what you have to do from the assessment. That's what you should probably be doing, especially if the client has a history, in every session just to gauge where they're at and be able to document that as well. So know what the local information is for you. So say that the client, you put it this way, you don't want to wait 
until the client's in crisis to be like, oh, okay, well, now what do I do? So as your safety planning for yourself, which that should come first, then you want to have a great safety plan for your clients. What if somebody sitting in front of you is homicidal? Who are you going to contact to warn them? Like, where is your list of safety planning for the client? Not just the form that they have to fill out that you're required to add to the note, but have the, like a list of local police departments or mobile crisis units or um, hospitals and emergency rooms nearby. Make sure that they have filled out an emergency contact form because if you're in a place where you have sessions all day and your one o'clock client is suicidal and it's 145 and you got your two o'clock client sitting in the lobby you can't exactly say like well i'll be the one to take you to the hospital you're going to need to coordinate with some different local resources or and or their emergency contact to make the safety plan actually go through and keep them safe so make sure somewhere in your on your computer on your desk somewhere and work with your supervisor and other co-workers on this too because they might have done the groundwork for you but have that list somewhere too. So if something is going down, you know who to call and where to send these people. Um, Another thing is have liability insurance for yourself because there may be certain cases that you have to staff with someone from your liability insurance company. Um, You also wanna have that protection just in case something does go down. So make sure, even as a brand new therapist, even if the job that you're at says that They'll put you on their liability insurance. At the end of the day, they're going to protect themselves. So you want to know that you have your own liability insurance. And typically it's cheaper as a new therapist. It actually gets more expensive as you've been practicing longer, which initially to me didn't make sense because I'm like, well, now I've been doing this longer. Like, why is it more money? It's because there's you've seen more people. There's more potential to be sued. <laughs> so while you're a baby therapist, like get your own liability insurance. Super cheap. So I think it'll help you have that peace of mind. And like I said, another source of contact if there's something going on that you need to staff. But the biggest, biggest thing to focus on when it comes to safety concerns as a therapist is to trust your gut. There is going to be, whether it's school, supervisors, coworkers, um, the, your own pressure you put on yourself to be a certain way, movies, whatever it is, most therapists are going to have this idea of like, well, maybe I'm transferring these feelings from a different situation, or maybe this is something that is my own anxiety, or maybe this is this, 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 this. Like there's going to be a million other things and systems and people telling you that like what you feel is a problem or a symptom of something bigger or something unresolved. And sometimes that's the case, but if your gut is telling you, you meet with a client and your gut's like, something's not right about them. I don't feel comfortable with them. I don't know that I could work with them. They're creeping me out. Like whatever it is, we're allowed to feel that way. We are people first. Being a therapist is your job. It's your career. It's not necessarily your identity. Certain pieces of it may be really close to like the value system you hold or what your personality is might come through a lot in sessions. But at the end of the day, it's a job. So you need to trust your gut and your instincts because they will rarely steer you wrong. So if there is a situation you're like, okay, met with a client, they're creeping me out. I don't understand why I need to process this. That's where supervision comes into play. That's where talking to coworkers or having a consult group will come into play. And they can try to, or your own therapist, like they can try to help you sort through, is this actually like, because they remind you of your crazy ex-boyfriend from high school? Or is this a situation that there is something that's going on that your gut is trying to warn you about and you're mentally trying to talk yourself out of it? So pretty much always trust your gut take like the strictest precautions possible and then you can work your way back so if if somebody if a client comes across as like flirty or touchy-feely and there's you're just like "Mm -mm, this is not right then like I said staff that that doesn't mean you have to immediately be like nope done can't work with this client but you definitely need to get some supervision so you can sort through like is this me is this the client? Is this a little bit of both of us? And is this somebody I can actually do good work with? One thing I feel like I was not told enough as 
a grad student and pretty much as a therapist in what many of the places I've worked at is that you do not have to work with everybody. You don't. You are not responsible for taking care of every single client who is put on your caseload or who you've done an intake with. Part of being a great therapist, not even a good one, but a great one, is to recognize where your limitations lie. And sometimes those limitations might be something like, well, I don't have eating disorder training and this client like, very clearly has an eating disorder, so I ethically can't work with them. Sometimes it's gonna be, this client makes me feel weird. I don't feel good when they're in my space. And because of that, I don't think I can do my best work with them. That is not a failure on your part. That is you making a clinical decision for the client that ethically is best for them. Because maybe there's somebody out there who doesn't have that feeling from them. Maybe there's a better fit for them somewhere out there. All you know is it's, you're not it. And if you're spending all your sessions dreading seeing this person, scared in the same space as this person, uh, just not feeling great about them, you're not going to do your best work. And at the end of the day, are you really helping them? Probably not. So make sure that you understand to trust your gut and that you don't have to work with everybody. We are not a great fit for everybody. Like it's just, it's not possible. And there's so many therapists out there. I understand some people in rural communities might be like, I'm the only one who specializes in this area for 100 miles. But with virtual therapy now, there's so many options, so many options. And I think that is something that needs to be explored. So maybe part of you coming into whatever environment that you're in is having a really good referral list. So if you do come across those clients that you're just like, nope, can't happen, you've got a place to send them to and go from there. So make sure also that you're setting appropriate boundaries with all your clients as well from the very first session because that is what's gonna set the tone for the remainder of them. So if you're setting those good, healthy, professional boundaries, you might be just like a tiny bit less likely to have people cross them. Some people won't care, <laughs> but at least you know you're doing your part to set the tone for future sessions. So like I mentioned earlier, the point of this video is not to scare you, not to make you think that like every place you're in, you're going to be in danger because I would say probably like 95% of the time, and I've been doing this, I got my undergrad degree in 2009. So I started working at a facility that year. So since then, I've been in multiple places in this field, worked with multiple populations in a few different states. And I can tell you that 95% of the time, I felt fine. I felt safe. Maybe there was some clients who were like a little bit annoying or like really weren't doing the work that I know they were capable of, but they could have. Or, you know, some people that I was like, ooh, what they just said is a little strange, but okay. But really 95% of the time I have felt fine and safe. There's only been like that 5% of a situation here or there or there that I was like, uh oh, something's, something's going off for me. So I think you have to learn to trust your gut. And I wish that that was talked about more. So use your resources, talk to people, you know, so use supervision, consultations, everything to kind of sort through some of those situations. But above all else, value your safety first because you need to, like I said, you're a human first. So therapist second. And for your sake and your family's sake and everything else, just, Make sure you are taking those precautions that I mentioned earlier and you'll feel safer. So if you feel safer and you're able to focus better, you're going to be a better therapist for all your clients. So it, a few little things, change the placement of the door, or watch the stuff you keep in your space. A few small steps are going to make you feel a lot more comfortable going to work and being in a space where you're meeting with clients because it's kind of weird that for our job, we literally talk to strangers all day. <laughs> And just like in the real world, not every stranger you meet is going to be the best fit. They're not going to be the nicest. There's going to be a couple strange ones out there or some that just give you a weird feeling. So we don't have to work with everyone and we need to be safe. So hopefully this video helped 
you have a few like practical things that you can do either in your space currently or in future spaces to help you feel safe and prepare to do your job in the best way possible. So I hope that this video gave you some clarity, didn't scare you too much. <laughs> and the point of this whole channel is to talk about the stuff that's not covered in grad school or maybe not covered well enough. So this is a very detailed uh, ride into how to be safe in this field. So take the precautions you can and go from there. Well, if you want to stay on top of content, then subscribe below and I'll see you next episode. Thanks.